I want to speak to you today on the beginning of a series of messages called The Landmark of Revival. The Landmarks of Revival. We're going to do several ones. And the, the issue is, is that we are not wrong. I don't think we have fallen away from the faith. We love the Lord. But I think our apathy, our spiritual apathy has taken over. And so it's not that we are wrong, but we could be more righteous, more right, more uh, of a servant of God. And we need revival uh, in, in the house. We, we, we need a, the landmark of revival. And so today, we're going to talk about the first landmark, and it's an, it's an interesting landmark. It's the landmark of anguish. The landmark of anguish. There's been other landmarks. There's been landmarks of, of victory and of uh, promises kept by God. And we're going to share a couple of those with you to kind of get you in the context. But what we're going to end up in is on the landmark of anguish. Now, the word anguish means extreme pain or distress to the point of crying out. Okay, that's, it may be emotional, and the emotional turns into physical. Uh, that's why you read of Jesus, his anguish was, his sweat became as great drops of blood. He was praying, and the anguish of it was very, very real. How many's ever had a prayer or a cry or a situation that you were in anguish over? Look at that, look at that. I think all of us have been, I mean, it's like, there's the hopeless, if not hopeless, at least helpless situation. Your spirit told you you had hope in God, but your mind was going, what in the world? Okay, anybody been there? Your spirit said all things work together for the good, but your mind said, I don't see any good. Okay, all right. In anguish. But you see, a lot of times the anguish that we uh, manifest is anguish over personal situations, things that, that we want to be corrected. And today we are going to magnify the context of anguish uh, today. It's not a very uh, popular type thought because, you know, in church, you, you, the, the messages are to let, let's see where our victory is and, uh, you know, what God's going to do for me and my blessing. But you see, God has anguish. Okay, he had anguish over his people. Jesus had anguish. Jesus wept. How often would I have gathered you as a little one would gather his, his own like a hen would gather her little ones under her wing, but you would not. He had anguish. He wept. Okay, he wept at the foot of the hill of Golgotha. He wept in the garden of Gethsemane. Um, he wept. But let's start with the landmarks of revival, and, uh, and we've got to get this context. So I'm going to give you definitions of landmark and revival. We want to be clear on, on what they are. I'm going to ask them to go ahead and throw on the screen Hebrews chapter 11, 8 through 10. Okay, Hebrews 11, by faith. Well, if you don't do anything else, do those two things. Okay, all right, get that in you. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, everybody say place, which he should after receive for an inheritance, the promised inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing where he went. Anybody ever had somebody to tell you, hey, just go, and I'll just tell you the turn right before you turn. Is that, is that uncomfortable? Well, we become used to it. It's somebody called Siri and MapQuest. And we just put in a destination and we're just whatever they say. We don't know the street names. We don't know where it's headed. At one time it took Beth and I and our little family on a, in a midnight trek through Georgia and the roads got smaller they got less paved, okay, all right. 
There was another time we were supposed to meet someone to have a nice respite. They had given us this, this beautiful week uh, at, a, at a secluded lodge and somehow it got us turned around and we ended up going through a pasture. Okay. And it got deeper and it kept saying, keep going and keep going. And Beth said, we're not going to keep going. And I said, well, hey, this is what it says. She said, did you read the sign on the fence post? No trespassing. <laughs> okay. But Abraham was called to go out into a place which should, after receive for inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing where he went. Can you trust God with the destination? By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. So the land of promise he was in, he was building tents, he was raising family, he was putting crops together, he was that promised land and the Lord had told him wherever you set your foot that's what I'm going to give you and he's enjoying the promises of God but he's enjoying those promises of God as in a strange land. The promised inheritance was not his final destination. Somebody needs to preach with me right here because the enemy wants you to think that the blessings are only temporal or earthly and that's what we pray over a lot. And our trouble is only earthly and we pray over that a lot. But you know, we wage war in the heavens. Our fight is not with flesh and blood. <laughs> he travels as in a strange land dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Four. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Wow. So when you read that scripture, you understand that Abraham was grateful for the inherited promise, but he was looking for an eternal city. How many are grateful for what God has done in your life? Say amen. How many are grateful that God's brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light? He set you on a right course. He steadied your feet and whatever you set your hands to do, he's prospered and every step that you take, he's guided. You felt the Holy Spirit. You don't even know how you got where you got, but you're here because God is here and you're grateful for it. But how many of you will agree with me, this world is not our home, baby? Uh, we're passing through. He sojourned. <laughs> he was passing through. Let me give you the Old Testament context of that Hebrews verse. In Genesis chapter 12, you can read that God has made a promise. He's spoken to Abraham and he said, Abraham, I'm gonna make you uh, of your seed a mighty nation. Many nations will come out of you. And, and so it did. And, and it will be as the sands of the sea and, and as the, or the sands of the seashore and the stars of the heavens. And, and, and he's talking about this and he blessed him. And then there was a time that Abraham went and glorified God and prayed to God. And God spoke to him again. He said, I'm going to do this for you and for your children and for your grandchildren. From generation to generation, I'm going to keep my promise with you. And it was at this point in this kind of conversation, that Abraham was talking with God as a friend. Anybody got God as a friend? Anybody, God have you as a friend? Amen. So he's talking with a friend and, and we hear Genesis 12 and verse eight. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel. Bethel means house of God. And he pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east and there he built an, an altar, a landmark unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. You see, this altar was made of stone. It was meant to weather the elements and to stand the test of time. It was not just some kind of half-shod, put-together thing so he could kneel and pray and move on. But every, time, every stone that he laid in that moment at that altar before God in worship of God, he intended for it to say so that his children could go back and look at the landmark and his grandchildren could go back and look at the mount, landmark and say, this was where Father Abraham was promised by God that we would be blessed and here we are 
are in the middle of all the turmoil in 2024 and people trying to rip the land out of Israel's hand and, and try to have a have a, a holy jihad against the God of the people of God himself we find that they are still being protected and preserved and they are conquerors and they're victorious why because of a landmark and if you go over there in t- today and you take a tour there'll be people and all of these tours are there for different landmarks of the Christian faith of the Old Testament times where you could go and say God moved here God answered there God restored here God forgave here and you can see all of it Lord take us to the landmarks the landmarks let me give you the definition of landmark landmark A landmark is a place of which you can see or, under, or, or perceive and it will tell you your position. That's what a landmark is. If you take a landmark, you can look at that and you can say, I am here because of that landmark. In other words, it's saying, whatever I see helps me to know wherever I am. And so I'm going to ask you, what do you see today? We are in a world today that we have seen with our physical eyes. We have heard with our physical ears. We have touched with our physical hands. But we have not opened our eyes of the heart. Eyes, ears, and hands will give you circumstantial evidence. But when you see with your heart, you will get reality. What is the reality behind why you are even sitting in the seat you are today? What is the reality behind how God brought you here? How many of you, you could raise your hand, don't have to hear it now, you could raise your hand and say it was a very real possibility had God not intervened, I would be dead today. How many, how many is right there that you, I mean, you would, you would say, you know what? I, I had no chance, I had no hope, I had no authority, I had no right, I was an alien, I didn't know anything about it I didn't care anything about it I was forsaking God blaspheming his name and all the time he was rescuing me out of myself hallelujah Mm -hmm. landmark what do you see do you recall when Elisha was surrounded by the armies of the king of Syria remember that story Great story. I think we need to kind of dive into it a little deeper, though. So if you read the book of Ezra, which is a great prelude to reading Nehemiah, I'd encourage you to read Ezra before you read Nehemiah. It's right at the front of you, Nehemiah. You'd be good. But what it does, it tells you the details of some of the things I'm going to tell you and get you to this point in Nehemiah's life. Nehemiah and Israel in the days of Ezra they had been overcome they had been conquered I don't know how long I can't tell you how long Nehemiah lived or when he was born but I can tell you that Israel was in captivity to Babylon because of their disobedience Israel had been conquered and become a slave nation. Babylon put great distress on them. But it was a little bit later, a few decades later, that Medo-Persia came along and they conquered Babylon. And so now Israel were slaves by attrition to the Persians. And the Persians had a little bit more tolerance to the welfare of people. And they begin to hear the cries of some of the slave Israelites and they said, we're going to let a remnant of you, a group of you, go back to Jerusalem. We're going to let you go back. And so they did. Nehemiah wasn't one of them. Why? 
because God will place you where he best can use you. Mm. He wasn't in the church service hooping and hollering. He might have been in the nursery. Okay. All right. He wasn't in the last convention meeting and enjoying the blessings of God. He was at the house kneeling and crying with a loved one. But here's the truth. Nehemiah, God positioned him to be, listen to this, in a spiritual position to influence a secular society. I'm talking to the business people here today. I'm talking people who go to work tomorrow. Okay, God has positioned you. Mm -mm -mm. Yes, he is. I'm talking about people who have been blessed to be a blessing. <laughs> God has positioned you to be in that spiritual place where God can use you to influence a secular society, not the other way around. Okay, all right. He wasn't even a preacher yet. We know him as the weeping prophet, Nehemiah later. Or Jeremiah's a weeping prophet. Nehemiah was the one that wept though. Now, why did he weep? Well, let's go into the scripture. I want them to put Nehemiah chapter 1. I want them to put verse 1 on the screen. We're going to follow along. Now, let me just, just tell you that as you're getting this spot, that we ought to have a burden for mankind. We ought to have a burden for the lost. Now listen, in this world today, uh, um, <laughs> I wrote this morning, I'll, I'll just call it a message to myself. I've got it in here. If the Lord lets me use it, I would use it. But not now. But God gave me a message in response to the things that were happening at the Olympics. He gave me a response. I'm not going to have time to tell you this, but here's what I want you to know. Okay? That regardless of what's going on in this world, the scripture says God is not mocked. No, people will try to mock God. Okay? People tried to mock Jesus. But God is not mocked. We are so wound up in the circumstances of a people of whom we should understand they are sinners. They don't have a God like we do. They don't have a peace like we do. They don't have an understanding like we do. And they are the very people that Jesus said through his analogy, go out into the highways and byways and compel my people to come in that my house might be full. We've talked about how terrible it looked on the screen. Would we invite them into our sanctuary? You know what the world doesn't need? It doesn't need the church to be tolerant. But it does need the church to be truth in love. I'm just going to let that park. I'll, those are some other things. We'll, we'll just live there for a minute. Let me give you Elisha. Do you remember when Elisha was surrounded? We'll get to Nehemiah. Remember when Elisha was surrounded by the armies of Syria? Great story, right? I bet you could tell me what happened. Well, let's go a little bit further. Okay. Elisha. He was a thorn in the people of Aram's side, especially the king of Aram or the Aramaeans. These are also called the Syrians, okay? And I just want to give you a sidebar and tell you that the Arabs 
and the Israelites. They are both descendants of Shem, one of the three sons of Noah that was saved in the ark. Okay? Mm hmm. Every one of them. Out of Shem came 27 different nations and cultures of people. Okay. What's that saying? They're your brother. Uh, I don't know about that, preacher. Preacher, anybody ever been to a reunion and that uncle came? Uh, yeah. That cousin? Mm hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it was awkward. I mean, they just weird, they're messed up. Everybody's on pins and needles. What are they going to do? What are they going to say next? But listen to me. Regardless of how they acted and what they've done and how much trouble they caused the family, they are still blood. They're still blood. You ever wonder why we get so upset and kind of a little annoyed about it? Because we kind of got in our mind that, you know what? My crazy uncle, he got the same blood I do. There might be a little tendency in me if I don't harness this to go that way. Okay? Yeah. So we find ourselves looking at our brother. We find that the Arabs and the Israelites, and right in this specific scripture of Elisha, we have Judah, Jerusalem, against the king of Syria. And they are brothers. When we do not accept God as father, we will not accept mankind as brother, as family. We won't. Let me, let me just reverse that. Can I get, hit it a little harder? If we have prejudices against people, religious, political, saved or unsaved, skin color, denomination, if we have prejudices that way, then I, I'm, I'm concerned that we have not acknowledged God as the father of all. Now, check yourself, okay? Because that blood is in you, baby. Yeah. And if you go to the reunion and you don't see that crazy relative... You might be the crazy relative. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Hey. <laughs> They're both descendants of Shem. Genesis 10 traces the genealogy from Shem to Aram. Genesis 11 traces the genealogy from Shem to Abram, which was Abraham. Truth. Disobedience to God leads to brother against brother. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be sober, be vigilant. Hang on just a minute. The entire Middle East is brother fighting against brother. The world and even the United States is fighting brother against brother. The church family gets sucked into this as well. We're quicker to disagree over doctrine than focus on faith. We often choose righting the wrong over reaching the lost. Jesus put it like this, Matthew 10, 21 and 22. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death and the father the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Here's Elisha's story. Aram is wanting to destroy Israel. And every time the king of Aram or the king of Syria finds a place where Israel's supposed to be, he takes his armies there and Israel is not there. It's like somebody told them and they scoot off somewhere else. It happened not once, not twice. You read the scriptures. And he's going around and the king of Syria 
looks even within, he goes, okay, who's the mole in my camp? Okay, all right. Who is of our group going and telling Israel that we're coming? And they said, oh, king, live forever. It's not us, it's that Elisha. Their God is telling Elisha and Elisha's telling them to scoot. He gets mad. He goes, where is Elisha, by the way, right now? Well, the last we heard, he's in the city of Dothan. All right. Take the chariots and the horses. Don't just go marching in. Surround the whole city. So he did. And the Bible says that early in the morning, the servant of the man of God looked out from the mountain over the city of Dothan and in the distance he saw the armies of Syria completely encamped around chariots and horses. (laughs) He says, the King James Version says, alas, isn't that a poetic? Is that what you say when you're in real trouble? (laughs) Alas, okay, no, no, (laughs) I'm saying, What? Are you kidding me? He said, what are we going to do now? And Elisha prayed. And he said, Lord, open up the eyes of my servant that he might see. And God opened up his eyes And where he had seen the armies of Syria, now he sees an inner circle. Armies, chariots of fire. They are around Elisha and they are around the servant and they're facing outward toward the armies of the enemy and they're about ready to go war. Here's what I'm telling you. You can look at circumstances with this eye or you can look at circumstances with this eye. Okay? Do you believe God's got you? Do you believe God's going to meet you right where you are? Do you believe God is protecting you? Let me tell you something. You know what this tells me? This tells me, according to the word of God, that there are angelic hosts, the army of God, that stands ready. We have ministering spirits, the Bible says, angels that are in charge over us. You don't believe it? You remember the scripture? Jesus, why don't you cast yourself down so that these angels would come and pair thee up? Okay? lest you cast your foot against a stone. God has made it so angelic hosts would be around you. You don't even think about it right now, but there are angelic hosts that are assigned to you and your name. (laughs) Woo! And I'm going to tell you something. When I begin to think about that, I never quit having church. We might close right here and go our separate way, but me and God, we're a majority. And the angelic hosts, we shout to the glory of God. Amen? Amen? So you got them. You ever been in that situation where it just seemed like no matter what you did and how much energy you put in and how much ingenuity and genius you tried to come up with, you couldn't fix the situation? You ever been there? And then in one day, God does what you've been trying to do for a lifetime? Those are those ministering spirits. When you really cry out to God for his help and let God do it, he says, the battle is mine. (laughs) Well, when that servant saw those angels and chariots of fire, it was not a lass anymore. Okay. That's not all the story. You ought to be excited about that. But that's, 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 listen, there are times that when God brings you a deliverance, he'll add some humor to it. Have you ever laughed at how you got free? Come on. Have you ever just went, are you? Did that really happen? Yeah, that happened? Yeah. And you just laugh how God did it, okay? Uh, Eating in the presence of your enemies, okay? Uh, In the presence of enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. In the presence of my enemies, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days. In the presence of the enemy, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. (laughs) forever okay yes Bible says that the Syrian army began to advance toward Dothan here's a well, here's the truth just because you know and you can see with your spirit that there are angelic hosts that are encamped around you 
in the church does not mean the world can see them. They will advance anyway. That's why we have mockery that's going on right now. We have people that are ridiculing the name of God and they are saying there is nothing to it. Why? Because they can't see the chariots of fire. They can't see God like you see God. <laughs> so here they come advancing. And when they came advancing, Elisha saw that and he prayed and he said, Lord, smite them with blindness. And immediately all of them became blind. Now, can you imagine this? They're walking and they're running and they're riding their horses and they're, they're guiding their chariots and now they become blind and it's just chaos. I mean, you know what they do? I think immediately they stop because they are blind, okay? And they don't know where they're going. And watch this. Elisha, whom they are looking for to kill, goes right in the middle of them because they're blind. And he says to him, hey, follow me. I will lead you to the guy you're looking for. <laughs> now that's something else now. I love that. And so he led them and they were following him because they are blind and they can't see. <laughs> and they get to a point and he leads them to Samaria. He leads them to the encampment of Jerusalem and Judea in front of the king of Judah and Jer Jerusalem. And then their eyes were opened when they got to Samaria and they looked around and they had once been surrounding Elisha and now they are surrounded by the entire camp of Israel. That's my dad. That's my dad. We're not done. How in the world do we respond to our enemies? How do we respond to people who accuse us and say things and do things and try to thwart what we're going to do and say bad things about the name of Christ and, and, and they are, are being sacrilegious and, and they are in your face and it may be someone in your neighborhood or in your family or it could be somebody that you saw in the nationwide situation. But how is it that these enemies have come against you and now you have victory over them just like Israel did over Syria and the question question is, what are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with your enemies? The king got excited, king of Jerusalem. He sees all these armies, and he goes, hey, prophet, hey, can we kill them? Read it. Should we kill them? I think I want to kill them. Come on, anybody ever had trouble in your life and you wanted to kill it? And some of it had a name. <laughs> you just think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay hands on them suddenly and pray for them. Okay, all right. All right. Can we kill them? And Elisha said, not so. The word of the Lord says, you got a group of people that were your enemies, and now you have conquered them. And here's how I want you to take care of them I want you to get them water I want you to get them food I want you to feed them till they're full can you imagine what the our Aramean army felt when they looked up and saw they were completely surrounded and know that was probably their last day Israel had slain millions in previous times they knew something really divine had happened they had been smoked by blindness now they were able to see again and now they are in the bondage of Israel it's our last day they just fed them and after they got through feeding them I imagine the Aramean army was thinking well they've gotten us fat and full now they're going to kill us okay that was just fool's gold and Elisha said, when they get done eating, send them back home to their king. That, my friends, is redemption. That, my friends, is when your enemy 
can become your brother when you will forgive, you will restore, and by the authority of God, feed them instead of fight them. Feed them. Feed them. And the Bible says that when the people, the armies got back to the king of Aram, kings of Syria, they told him everything that had happened, and the Bible says Syria never invaded them again. I'm going to ask you something. Do you want a victory for a day or a victory for a lifetime? It will be determined on how you treat the people and the situations that have been your enemies. Mm. Let me just tell you what Jesus did. He's naked on a cross. His mama is right there seeing him, an adult male, naked in front of everybody. The last of his possessions are, are, are being, uh, uh, lots have been chosen. or they're, they're, they're doing all kinds of, uh, uh. he's had something written in his side. They've had mockery. If you be the son of God, take yourself down from here. You've saved others, can't you not save yourself? And there's all of that's going on. In the middle of two thieves, and naked. And Jesus' response to his enemy, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. I don't have time to give you my synopsis on the, on the Olympics, and maybe one day I will, if the Lord allows I preached to me this morning for an hour and a half and wrote it down. But I will tell you this. Whatever you saw, however you, it made you feel, those people need a Savior. We got eternity to look forward to. Because we love the Lord and because the Lord loves us and we know him and he knows us but they don't and so their only God is them and so how do they deflect away from the confrontation that they are in sin how do most people deflect from the confrontation that there's sin in front of our face that we've committed it how is it number one we'll either deny we ever sinned or number two we'll deny there was ever a God and the mockery is questioning the Christian faith. But if the Lord were to come right now, David, where are you going? Susan, you know where you're headed? In the midst of all of what you've been going through, you know where you're headed? Danny? You got an idea where this ends? Colonel Frank, you got an idea of where your life has led you to this point? And where are you going? Josh and Laura, with all the hospital visits and the questions, do you know who's got you and your family? Well, then how in the world are we going to remain disturbed when we should be anguished over the lost? I want you to stand with me. Because here is the landmark. I want you to give you some homework. I want you to read Ezra. I don't have time because I feel the Holy Spirit directing. I'd love to read all this to you. I did this morning. But I'm going to ask you to read 1-1 through 2-7 of Nehemiah. I want you to read all of Ezra. 
and then read. Okay? All right? Let me tell you what happened. Ezra points out that from the time that Israel was conquered by Babylon to the time that Nehemiah heard from his brother about the walls was over 130 years. We look at these sometimes and we think this happened in a couple of days. This was 130 years where Israel has been a slave to Babylon, then a slave to Persia, and finally Persia gives a few of them, not all of them, a few of them to go back to Jerusalem. Okay. But when they get there, their eyes see something. They see broken down walls. They see temples that are broken down. And each brick is a reflection of a broken culture. But let me tell you what happens. The longer that we can live with brokenness, the more we'll accept it. And so they lived. They saw it. How many kids and grandkids went under their family and walked by the same broken wall, the same burnt out gate. They walked by it and they walked by it and nothing was ever being restored. So the Bible says in Nehemiah that in the month of, I think it's Cushi, I think that's the word. You'll see it. When Nehemiah heard that from his brother, Chislu, thank you. In the 20th year, I was in Shushan, the palace. You hear that? Not a preacher. Brother came. He told him. And the Bible says that he wept for days. Day and night, Nehemiah wept. What was it? It was anguish. It was anguish. It was extreme distress over the fact that it wasn't just bricks that were broken down. His people were broken down. <coughs> it was not just a city in ruins. It was a culture in ruins because they had disobeyed God. And he made this statement. He said, Lord, please forgive us because I and my people have sinned. Don't you put it on the United States. Don't let them be by themselves. You and I and the United States have sinned. That's why we're here. Okay. Okay. All right. That's why we're here. All right. The Bible says that he prayed. Now go to 2 1. Try to put that on the screen. If you can go there. It came to pass in the month of Nisan. This is four and a half months between the time he heard the brother from the time he had been weeping. Four and a half months he is weeping and praying. Over 130 days. It's been over 150, almost 150 years, over 130 years, we know for sure that they've been in bondage. It's 130 days that he is praying and weeping and crying and fasting and praying and weeping and crying. And you know what, Brother Bob? It's not gonna do for you and I to pray a 30-second prayer. If we really want God to do something, we'll get on our knees before God, okay? And so he did. And then it says, when all that took place, when everything had happened, the king looks at him. And the king says, Why are you so down in your face? You're not sick. There's nothing wrong with you. I know you're not sick. You've been eating what I've been eating and you ain't dead. By the way, cupbearer was not just to taste the wine and the food to make sure that the king didn't die, somebody had poisoned it. No, because of that kind of trust, this man, Nehemiah, had great influence in all the king's court. He was an administrator. He was a businessman, just like you. 
He became a prophet later. We know him as a prophet. But he started out as a king. Look at the last verse of Nehemiah 1. For I was the king's cupbearer. Okay. 130 days. And the king says, what's wrong? And the Bible says that as soon as the king asked the question, what would you have me to do? The Bible says that Elisha went and prayed before the Lord. Or Nehemiah prayed before the Lord. Now why? He'd been praying for 130 days. Here it is. Listen to me real close. This is something I want you to keep. You may be praying for the right need for a long time. But when that time comes, ask the Holy Spirit to have you pray the right question. What is it that you need? God spoke into his heart and he said, King, I'd like for you to allow me to go back to my home and rebuild the walls. Rebuild a culture. See, he wasn't going to just be rebuilding walls. You find out, if you read one through four, you can find that there were different families of different types of groups and different occupations and all kinds of people. They were taking care of each of them had a gate. Okay? Each of them had a gate. It started from the north and went clockwise all the way around and each of them built a gate. And they were all building at the same time. They were doing it at the same time. They come together and the bricks came together at the same time. And the, and the, the post and, and the swing gates and all that was at the same time. And this was all of the gates, the dung gate. Uh, it was the sheep gate. It was the water gate. It was, it, it, was, it was all of those gates. It was the eastern gate. And each family went together. You know what he did? Before he could build a wall, he had to build a family. I'm going to tell you something. You're looking on the outside, looking in. Don't get the cart before the horse. Start with yourself and your family. Okay, build that first. And he did. And the Bible says in 52 days, 130 plus years that they looked at it, nothing. 130 days that he prayed, nothing. But when God gave him the answer, 52 days the entire wall with all the gates were complete you need to go back and look on Google Google the old wall this ain't a fence okay okay so I'm going to ask you will you go back to the landmark Nehemiah's landmark was anguish that was his landmark. He wept and he wept and he wept. And Jesus wept until his sweat became as great drops of blood. And there was anguish. There was anguish. And when will we have anguish? Why did not any other man of Israel have an answer? It's because no one else was in anguish, in prayer of anguish. How about the Jerusalem in our own hearts? How about the walls of faith in our own hearts? Are they broken down and we're living with them? Or are we in anguish and saying, God, build me back to where I should be with you? You see, the devil wants to take the fight out of you. No praying, just posting. No passion, just passivity. No prayer, just procedure. Let me tell you this. This is the altar call. It's never too early to get serious with God. But it can be too late. So I'm going to ask you to step up here. Brianna, you're doing an amazing job. Amen. But I feel the presence of the Lord in here. I'm going to ask you to walk up here and say, I need to some, do some rebuilding. Yeah. I need to have anguish. The cares of this world has got me so distracted that if it don't just deal with me and my little situation, I don't seem to be bothered. Or I'd rather fix a world all of apart, you know, a half a day apart. I'd rather fix them than to fix my life. I'd rather fix the Olympics rather than fix my family. 
I'd rather be involved in doing some outreach and donating than I would being a discipler. And I want to tell you something. I feel the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you 30 seconds more. And I mean it. The Lord does not tarry. I'm going to give you 30 seconds more and then we're going to pray. Mm-hmm. That's right, Susan. Nehemiah reminded God of his promise. He said, Lord, you promised us. And it wasn't about if they were right or wrong. You just promised us. And Lord, please, because I and this nation have sinned. I and my family have sinned. I and my neighbors, my brothers have sinned. We're not going to blame this on the Arameans. We're not going to blame it on the king of, of Syria. We're going to put it where it belongs, right here. We disobeyed and that's why we have found ourselves in bondage. Now watch God work. I mean it, watch him work in your life. Watch the ministering angels come your way. I tell you, I feel it right now. Watch the those angelic hosts, those armies that are camped around you. Watch them begin to work. Hallelujah. Matter of fact, you don't even have to say what you're praying for right now, but go ahead and say it anyway. Because God knows the intent of our heart. He knows what we're thinking before we think it. And in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, I pray, let me have anguish again. Let me be truly sorry for my sin. Let me be truly sorry, not for the trouble that I'm in, but for the tragedy that could be if I do not follow God. God, help me, forgive me, restore me. Hallelujah. Let your will be done in my life. And let me tell you something, when that happens, God will, hey, listen to me, God rebuilt Israel as he was rebuilding the wall. God's not going to forget the wall. Do you hear me? Listen, son, God's not going to forget the wall. Brother, God's not going to forget the wall. He is repairing and rebuilding you, but he is going to restore the things that you love, that you have a prayer for, that you have believed for, that you've cried for. Believe him. He's doing it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. I want everybody in the building. I want you to surrender right now. Whatever that looks like to you, I want you to surrender. I'm asking you to pray, and I'm asking you to go ahead and build a landmark of anguish. Be distressed over the situation so much that you will not quit praying until the answer is there. You will not quit crying out to God until the victory is won. In ooh, hallelujah. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Go ahead, praise him today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what's happening right now? God's reminding us what a landmark looks like. When Abraham was putting those rocks together, he didn't need a choir, he didn't need a band, he didn't need the, re need the right climate. He just felt the presence of God. And that's what you've done. You've responded to the presence of God in this place right now. And I remember when we were starting in choir, when we went to a, a full choir over there in that building, and we went to Norman, Oklahoma, and we sang a song. And one of my friends, she would sing this song. Gail Froud would sing, I started out to follow you a long time ago. We've been on the mountaintops and through the valley low. But it seems somehow I've lost my way through the cares of it all. But I remember a place where you spoke my name and I heeded your call. 
Lord, take me back to the old landmark where I'll make a new commitment and begin a fresh start. Help me find my direction. <laughs> Place a burden in my heart. Lord, take me back to the old landmark. And she would follow up. I don't know how far I've drifted or how long it may have been, but there's a hunger deep inside me to feel your spirit once again. For no matter what, the sacrifice, my first love to restore. You see my soul cries out to be renewed like never before. Take me back to the old landmark. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the presence that I have felt in this place. I thank you, God, for your word. And Lord, I just pray by your anointing and by your power that these people here who have given themselves to you, that the anguish in their heart is so true. Lord, I, I love how you work. When a praying man or woman really gets in anguish, you begin to reveal your heart to them and they begin to be not just normal, ordinary men, not just keep cup bearers, but they begin to be the witnesses and the disciples and the restorers of the kingdom back again. Lord, we glorify you and we thank you. Use us in Jesus' name. God bless you. We love you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.